come down to the reading and preaching God's word. And as I mentioned some time ago, as long as we continue in this lockdown, we'll continue to be bringing messages of hope and trust in God. So I preach you this morning from Psalm 56. I invite you to turn in your text to Psalm 56. He's using the Pew Bible, you find this on page 853. And before we actually read our text and hear God speak to us through it, I invite you to join me in prayer, asking God to illuminate our hearts and minds and we might to receive that which he has for us and put it in practice. Lord God, we do come before you, thanking you and praising you that you are so good to us, Lord. You remind us that you're a strong fortress to which we can run and be kept safe. Lord, you show us your promises, how you never forsake us or leave us. You're an ever-present help in times of trouble. So Lord, help us to always, no matter what we face, turn and cry out, in God I trust. Lord, help us to see why that's the case as we hear this word preached to us this morning. And Lord, help us not just be passive listeners, but impress this word on our hearts. Lord. Cause us to truly trust in you to show it by how we live, to be not just hearers, but doers of your word. We ask, Lord, we might truly seek to live out your commands each and every day. And Lord, I ask to be with me, your servant, that the words I speak be not my own word, but your word as a you, Lord, are speaking to your people directly through me as your instrument. And Lord, be with each one who's gathered here in the sanctuary and those who are watching in the live stream. Help us, Lord to see what it is you want us to see, to hear what it is you want us to hear, and to be transformed by the power of your word. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So Psalm 56, we're going to read all 13 verses. Hear now God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attack will oppress me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk. They watch my steps as they've waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples of God. You've kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling. That I may walk before God in the light of life. Sally's running down the street screaming, banging on doors. Help, he's after me, he's going to get me. She's desperately seeking help. And she sees lights on in the homes, so she bangs on the doors, hoping someone will open up and let her in. But sadly, nobody does. And this leaves Sally wondering, what is going on? Is there anybody I can trust? You ever find yourself in that type of situation? Desperately seeking help and not knowing where to turn to for help? Wondering who you can trust? This is a very common problem we all face. Because we face fears, frights, and foes in this life. that can leave us wondering, where do I find help? Who do I turn to? Where do I find my trust? And the problem we often have is we place our trust in the wrong places and the wrong people. And that's why you want to listen carefully this morning. Because through this text, you're going to see how David's doing just like Sally and knocking on strangers' doors. But God in his grace and mercy reminds David that what he needs to do is what we all need to do. is to say, in God I trust. So walk with me through Psalm 56. And here's what you're going to see this morning. You're going to see first, you can trust God. Second, God hears you. Third, man can't hurt you. And fourth, walk with Christ. 
And this is going to bring us to our big idea. Here's what I want you to grab hold of. Let this wash over you. Trust God to keep you walking with Christ. So first, you can trust God. You ever find yourself being attacked on all fronts? No matter which way you turn, there's another problem, another turmoil. Maybe it's your home battle with your spouse and your kids. You go to work and your boss and your coworkers make your life even more difficult. You go to the doctor and it's just more bad news, another horrible diagnosis. And in the top of all of who you thought was your best friend in the world, you come to find out has been lying your name, gossiping about you, telling others you're no good. These things happen in life and they cause us to fall into despair. They cause us to wonder, who can I trust? So when these things take place, don't do like Sally and not those strangers do yours, but do like David does here in our text. Cry out for God's mercy. No, you can trust God. Look how our text begins. Look at verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God. David knows where he needs to place his trust. His once former friend Saul is now seeking to kill him. So he runs to Gath, the Philistines, thinking it'll be safe there. But like Saddle banging on doors that just don't open, David finds it's just more trouble, more trouble. And understand here, David's facing some real problems. He's being trampled on, or more literally, hotly pursued. This is like Sally running down the street with her phone right in her heels. That's what David's facing. And why are they pursuing this way? Because they see him as a war enemy, a traitor. Somebody who's going to do society no good. You know when someone commits a crime and you have that nationwide manhunt that goes out? You go to any post office and the picture's up there? That's David's situation. He's got real problems that he's facing. And that's why verses 1 and 2 go on to show you why David cries out to God for help. Look at verses 1 and 2 how they go on. Look what it says. For man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. Notice that word there. Look at that word for. It's giving the reason why David's crying out to God for his mercy. It's showing you just how bad things are for David. He's being pursued, attacked, oppressed all day long. Notice that language, all day long. It's not stopping. There's no relief. It's endless. It goes on and on and on. These words here, all and many, they paint a picture of David's dire despair. And it's a lot like we're seeing here this morning, throughout the world. As you hear about COVID-19, isn't it just more bad news on top of more bad news? Rising infection rates, rising death counts, lowering economies, crashing stock markets. It's more bad news on top of another. And this is why so many, like David in our text, are afraid, filled with fear, running into panic. Because all you hear is bad news. And what this shows you is, if you want to find hope, then don't turn on the TV and go to CNN. Don't listen to Governor Murphy's daily briefings. But do something different. Turn to God. Say, in God I trust. And actually place your faith there. See, that's what David's doing here. Look at verse 3. Look what he says. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. These are honest words that show fear is certain to come. See, a lot of people think that fear is sinful, but it's not. Fear is what comes in our life. And you see David right here. He's saying when he's afraid, showing that you can be afraid. We all have things in our life that make us afraid. Aren't you fearful at times you're rich and falling apart? Aren't you fearful of losing your job, not having enough money to pay your bills, wondering how you're going to keep feeding your family? Aren't you fearful of getting ill, even of death? I mean, isn't that what COVID-19 is all about? People fearing not so much getting sick, but rather dying. Because all we hear is bad news. There's no hope being provided. Do you hear anybody talk about God and what he does and how he's still got you in his hands? Are you hearing that on the news? No. You're just hearing rising death rates, rising death rates. You're getting more and more and more. And this shows you what people are truly fearful of today. It's not about getting sick. It's about dying. You know how you know that? Because the flu comes around every season and the economy does not shut down. People don't stay locked in their homes because they know if they get the flu, they won't feel good for a while, but they'll get back. 
But all you're hearing with COVID-19 is you're sure to die. And people are afraid. People are fearful. Because people are afraid to die. And that's why you want to turn and look to your God. Because you're reminded that God sent his son to go to the cross and die for you. To purchase your pardon. To set you free from the fear of death. Understand, Christ does not free you from death. See, the reality is this. I don't care what type of mask you wear or how many you wear. I don't care how far away you stay from people. I don't care if you kept yourself locked up inside for the next three years. You're still going to get sick. You're still going to one day face death. Breathe your last. But you don't need to fear death if you understand that Christ died for you. Went to the cross to do what you couldn't do for yourself. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. Paid your, pet, your debt in full. So there's nothing remains. That means, even as you're staring death in the face, you don't need to be afraid of death. Because you know Jesus Christ died and rose again from the grave. Through his death and resurrection, you remind you why you can say, in God I trust. Just like David's doing here in our text. Look what he says in verse 4. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? These words show you why you can place your trust in God. Why you can say, in God I trust. Because David knows he's in a very real danger. This is not just possibilities here. He's got people out to kill him. Like Sally running down the street, banging on doors. Somebody's out to get David. They want to kill him. They make an end of him. But notice what David does. He stops looking at his circumstances. And instead... He turns and looks at the cross. You're seeing right here an illustration of 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that reminds us that as those united to Christ, we walk by faith, not by sight. So stop looking at your circumstances. Stop looking at rising death statistics and start looking to whom you belong. Look at the fact that Christ holds you in his hands and nothing can harm you. See, because here's the reality. Man may come against you. Disease may come knocking on your door, seeping under your door frame, through your windows, there's cracks in the walls. But if you know God, then you're safe. Even when you're banging on doors and nobody will open up, guess who always opens the door when you knock? Jesus Christ. And he tells you out of his word, if you knock, I will open up and welcome you in. Because through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, a relationship to your God, your triune God, is opened up and he invites you into union with him. And how do you know this is you here? Is Jesus Christ? Because think about it. David says, in whose word I praise. David's not talking about the scriptures we had today that we hold in our hands. You know why? Because they hadn't been written yet. David's speaking these words before they've been written. And it shows you he's looking to the one through whom his deliverance comes. He's looking to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This reminds us why we can say, in God I trust. Because Christ went to the cross to secure your victory. To set you free. That's why John 1 makes clear that Jesus is the word of God. The word made flesh who came and made his dwelling among us. When you hear this language about looking at God's word, you're seeing David say, look on Jesus Christ himself. Stop looking at all the statistics, all the dangers, all the foes chasing after you, and look at the cross and gaze upon God's word. And you know this is the case, that Jesus brings your deliverance? Because the writer of Hebrews tells you the exact same thing. Hebrews 13, 6 says, the Lord is my help, as shall not fear. What can man do to me? So as you face fears, foes, frights, these things that come your way, don't look at them, but again, glance your eyes heavenward, gaze upon the cross, and look on the word of God, Jesus Christ, the one who delivers you from sin and death. You do that, and then you can truly say, in God I trust, because you know you can trust God. And you know why you know you can trust God? 
Because God's always listening. Which brings us to our second point. God hears you. We all seem to have these times when it seems like nobody hears us. Nobody understands. Like Sally banging on doors and nobody opening up. We have these times when it seems like no matter what we say, nobody listens. You ever have those situations where it seems like nobody hears what you say? Like you cry all alone? Like nobody knows what you're going through? Have you ever said to somebody, you just don't understand what I'm going through? You don't know my situation? You've never been in my plight? See, this is common. This can happen. But when you think this, when it seems like you scream in silence, what you want to remember is God hears you. Because God's always listening. See, that's what Dave is showing us here. He's got people out together, chasing after him, suffering, truly suffering him. They're trying to harm him, twist his verbs. And like Sally running down the street screaming for help, there's nobody there to give him any help. Nobody opens up to let him in. It's kind of like when you face family and friends that turn on you. You ever had that? Somebody gets so mad at you, they kind of say, you're out of my life, I'm done with you. They kind of turn on you. I know she feels in just dire despair. What do I do? Who do I go to for help now? That's what David's going through right here. People seeking to twist his words, tear down what God has done through him. Look at verse 5. Look what it says. All day long, they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. See, this is showing you. When it says all day long, they injure my cause, this really is translated, they twist my words. And it shows the persistency of the attacks. Look at the words there again. All day long, all their thoughts. This is someone bent on your destruction, your demise. And I want you to notice something. There's a cowardice behind their attacks. They're not coming out in front and facing David to his face. They're talking about him behind his back, lurking in the shadows, hiding in the dark, waiting to attack him. See what you're seeing right here? is a picture of how destructive gossip can be. Really, that's what gossip does. It tears people apart because it tells people how bad you are. It doesn't actually face the circumstances or the facts. It just paints a picture. And it's usually done like this. Somebody smiles to your face. They shake your hand, pat you on the back, tell you what a wonderful job you're doing. And when you turn around, they stick you in a knife in the back because they gossip about you. Because why? They're not after good. They're after destruction. They want to tear things apart. They want to destroy what God is doing even through you. They wait for their chance to strike, to destroy you. And it's all done in secret. Just like you see in the text. So what it says here in verse 6. They stir up strife. They look. They watch my steps as they wait for my life. This is a pretty bleak picture. David's facing some pretty vicious attacks. People trying to undermine what he's done, who he is, what he says. And it shows something we're all prone to face today. You know what that is? Because if you're united to Jesus Christ, then you have his promise, his assurance, his guarantee that he gives you in John 15, 18, that just as the world hated him, so too the world will hate you. This is why you don't want to bang on the world's door seeking help. It's why you want to turn and say, in God I trust, and actually place your hope and trust in it. Can't you see the world turning a blind eye to Sally's situation in her plight? She sees the lights on, she's knocking on the doors, but they pretend like they're not home, like they can't hear. Nobody will open up the hell. But if you come to Jesus, then like we say, you knock, and he opens up and welcomes you. And how do you know this guarantee? Because he went to the cross to open the way to God for you. He didn't go to the cross and die for his sins. He went to the cross and died for your sins. So they might be covered over, washed away. You might be cleansed and purified. So you can actually have meaning behind those words. In God I trust. See, so think about this. Others might seek to harm you, to destroy you, to even take your life. But what does Jesus Christ do? He gives his life for you. He dies so you might be brought to saving life. You realize you're dead in your trespasses and sins, but through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're brought to life. That's what he does for you. So no matter what you face, no matter what fears or foes are around, no matter who's lurking in the shadows or the darkness, don't give in to fear or panic, but keep turning. 
to Jesus Christ, knowing what he's done for you, who he is, so you can always say, in God I trust, and know your Savior is you. And as you do that, watch how God takes your fears and has them just melt away. So you see in our text here, because God hears you. That's why those who seek to harm you will face God's judgment. Look at our text. Verse 7. For the crime will they escape, and wrath cast down the peoples of God. These words show how God hears you. David's crying out, God, take care of me. Harm my enemies. And he knows that they will one day stand before God for judgment. That's why he says, for their crime will they escape. See, God hears your cries. He sees your pain. He avenges you and delivers you. He takes care of you. I remember seeing this first hand years ago. Leslie and I had bought our first house. And the contract said the washer and dryer came to the house. And for some reason, the owner showed up three or four weeks later. I'm in my law office working. Leslie's on the phone crying, telling me he's taking our washer and our dryer. So I come to the house. He's got a motor in the back of the pickup truck. I'm reminded what the contract says. And he tells me, I don't care. So I appeal to God. I let him know I am God's child. This is God's stuff. You take these things, you're stealing from God, it will not go well for you. He says, I don't care. Pulls out of the driveway. So I was driving down the highway. 15 minutes later, a gust of wind blows this washer and dryer off the back of the pickup truck. They smash the pieces. So he winds up with no washer and dryer. But you know what he did get? Tickets for not securing it properly and causing an accident. In Romans 12, 19, that we don't need to seek to avenge ourselves. We can leave it to God. 12, 19 in Romans says, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. You can say, in God I trust, no matter what somebody's doing to you, because you know God hears you. So don't be afraid to cry out to God when you're truly suffering. And know that because God hears you, you never need to be afraid. Which brings us to our third point. Man can't hurt you. If you're like me, then I'm sure you've been hurt in the past. Whether it was from a punch in the eye, some really malicious and nasty words spoken about you or to you, or even from a love loss. These are things that happen in life. We face things like this. People we love die, and we suffer as a result. We get people to turn on us and attack us, and we suffer as a result. But even as you go through these things, as you're suffering, you can cry out to God and say, in God I trust. You can do this knowing that God so loves you, he sent his son to die for you. Which means man can't hurt you. There's nothing man, disease, or famine can bring that God can't protect you from or provide you, for, you, know, provide you with. That's the idea you're seeing here. Because what does God do? He doesn't just send his son to die for you, but he continues to care for you. You realize the tears you cry, God stores them up in a bottle. He puts them on his desk right next to his list. You know that list we all have? You ever tell somebody, you don't want to be on my list. You're on my list. You know that laminate list we have of our moral enemies? Well, God's got a list just like that as well. And you know who's on his list? Each and every person who unjustly, improperly, sinfully causes you to cry tears. God keeps them. And that reminds you, because God has a list. Man can't hurt you. This is what you want to see. Look at our text. Look at verse 8. You've kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your body. Are they not in your book? These words show how God's divine character, his goodness, his covenantal promises guarantee you that God is with you. That's what you want to remember, no matter what you're going through. That God is with you. And that means that because he is, there's nothing that man can do to you. Man can't hurt you. You never need to be frantically knocking on doors like Sally, begging people to open up. Because you've got a better way to go. You can turn to your God and cry out to him. God is right by your side. And that means those who seek to harm you will not get away with what they do. God is there, watching over, here, protecting so when you're being pursued and attacked, cry out and say, in God I trust, do this knowing that man can't hurt you. Look at verse 9. Look what it says here. 
Your enemies will turn back in the day when you call. This I know. God is for you. I want you to hear this again. Man can't hurt you. Because when you cry out to God, they turn back. Because God is for you. It's what Paul writes in Romans 8, 31 to 32, when he says this. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God didn't spare his own son to save you, how will he not also graciously give you all safety and protection? Everything you need. You need to know this. Because once again, you will face fear in this life. We have all sorts of things that come our way that make us afraid. We fear beasts and man. We're terrified of what people think about us or say about us. We get scared of losing jobs, getting sick, and even dying. Fear is common for us all. It's not sinful, but it can be dangerous. Because fear, when wrongly looked at, can lead us to panic. This is why you're not allowed to shout fire in a crowd of people. Because people will panic and trample one another to death. So instead of focusing on your fear, why not do something different? Take that fear and let it drive you to the cross. Let it cause you to look heavenward and say, in God I trust. And actually place your trust there. Gaze on God's promises. Look to the cross and do like David and actually praise God. Look at verse 10. Look what we read here. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. Once again, David is directing our attention to what we need to do. Be looking at God's word and praising God. This drives home the importance of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Knowing him in a personal and saving way. That again is what's in view here. Knowing Jesus Christ, who he is, what he does, and why it matters for you personally. See, it's not enough to just say, I know Jesus. You need to know him personally. He needs to truly be your Lord and Savior, the one in whom you're truly placing your trust. And that's why God can give that most common command in Scripture. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. Because he knows if you belong to Jesus Christ, then there's nothing you need to fear. Because Christ, again, went to the cross to set you free from the fear of even death. So turn to God and watch as your fear melts away. Look what David says in verse 11. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. This simple verse makes clear that simply saying, in God I trust, of turning to God for your hope and your salvation, is what causes fear to know away. This is because these words remind you how God always fulfills his promises, always does what he says, meets your needs both today and tomorrow. I mean, ask yourself, have you starved to death? I'm guessing not because you're here this morning. Have you ever faced a time where you just didn't know how something was going to turn out, convinced that it was going to go horribly wrong, there was just no hope, no answer, and didn't God bring you through it? Don't you find that every day there's food to eat, clothes to wear, even air to breathe? Aren't you surrounded by loved ones, people who come along your side and care for you and help you and watch out for you? God provides all this here and now. And it's even more than that, because while he provides for you today, he also assures you that your future secure. When someone says, be safe, say yes, be safe for eternity. Look heavenward. Think about how God sent his son to die, so as you stare death in the face, you know you're covered by the blood of Christ, and you stand secure. Those who don't know Jesus Christ, they will stand before God for judgment. But those who know Jesus Christ, those who cry out, God, I trust, and really live it out, they know Christ will stand there with them, saying, he's with me, she's with me, and you'll be safe and secure. See, you need to know this, because there's all sorts of things that cause us fear. But no matter what it is, even as you face the end of your life, know you can turn, and with great confidence and assurance say, in God I trust, because God is always faithful in what he says. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are kept safe and secure. Understand, man can't take away what Christ has done for you. The government may lock up inside your house, 
but they can't take away what Christ has done for you. No one, nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. And that's why David changes his perspective. And he says in verse 11, what can they do to me? This shows you why you don't need to be afraid. Because there's nothing that man can do to you that God can't protect you from. This is why Jesus Christ himself says in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who can kill body but not the soul, but fear him who can kill both soul and body in hell. A big problem we have today is we hear those words, we know those words, we're familiar with those words, but the minute fear creeps in, we forget it. And we turn away from Jesus. And we find and seek for our help in all sorts of other things. Knocking on strangers' doors. When you ought to be knocking on the door of Christ. Ought to be crying out, in God I trust. And entrusting yourself truly to him. Just think about it. Sally running down the street. Banging on neighbors' doors. And yet nobody opens up to help. Haven't you had similar situations where a man lets you down and they open up to help? Well, God's always there. He always opens the door, welcomes you in. You just need to humble yourself, confess your sins, cry out to him and say, help my unbelief. Cause me to say, in God I trust. Enable me to actually live it out. And you can do this more easily when you're reminded that man can't hurt you. Especially, especially if you're united to Jesus Christ. There's never a need to let your fear turn into panic. When you're united to Jesus Christ, you know you're always safe and secure. Which brings us to our fourth point, walk with Christ. I'm sure you've heard it said, you can't just talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. This is the idea. It's not enough to just say, I trust in Jesus, in God I trust. You need to actually put some meat on that by the way you live. You need to show where you place your trust by always walking with Jesus Christ and understand how you do so. That's what we're getting at right here. Look what David says in verse 12. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I want you to notice that word vow. See that word vow? It reminds us how God calls us into covenantal relationship with him. He initiates it. He moves in our direction. When you weren't looking for him, when you were walking in a different direction, he placed his name and claim upon you and drew you to himself. And he made a vow. Covenantal promises that are not easily broken. I mean, think about how few vows we take in this life. You know the most common vow we take? Our marriage vows. Maybe you took those vows yourself. Remember making those vows? Remember saying, I promise to be with you no matter what. I don't care what we face. I will never leave you. Remember the vows that they were? In riches and poverty, in health and sickness, better or worse. You didn't divorce your wife because she cost too much, did you? You didn't leave your husband because he got sick, did you? You don't say things are too hard to walk away from the marriage. And you know why you don't do that? Because the marriage vows are vows that God first makes with you. Because what are you as a church? You're the bride of Christ. So God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I don't care how sick you are, how poor you are, how messed up and sinful you are. Once I draw you myself, I will always hold you and keep you. Nobody can snatch you out of my hands. That's safe, that's security, that's a promise that's guaranteed. That's the vow that God makes to you. And that's why you know you can keep walking with Christ. And that's why you want to make thank offerings to God. That's what David's getting at right here. See, you can always walk with Christ because Christ first draws you to himself by securing your victory on the cross. Look at verse 12. Let me go on the say. I'll render thank offerings to you. And I hope you understand thank offerings, much like thank you cards, are given after the gift, not before. You don't give someone a thank you card before they give you a gift, do you? And the same way, you don't give a thank offering before the deliverance. You offer thank offerings because Christ has already delivered you. He's already secured your part on the cross. And because he does, you give him thank offerings, just like David says here. And that means you do what you say. You fulfill your vows. You fulfill your covenantal obligations. Just like God promises to you, you promise to God to keep walking with Christ. And to make sure that you will, 
He gives you everything you need. That's why Christ delivers you. Look at verse 13. Look what it says here. For you delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from fall. Once again, notice the four. It gives you the reason why you can walk with Christ. Because he first delivered you. He went to the cross to purchase your pardon, to set you free. Think of who he is and what he does. And the promise of peace. That gives you great assurance that you'll keep walking with Jesus Christ. Because here's the reality. Your obedience does not depend on your strength, your power, or your fortitude. It comes through Jesus Christ working through you. When you sin, it's an aberration. It's like you're walking away from Christ. Because Christ keeps calling you back. And he gives you his spirit. Think about that. You don't get any closer than that, do you? Christ so loves you that he sends his spirit to indwell you to guarantee that you keep walking with Jesus. You keep walking with Christ. That's why he saves you. So you can do just that. So you can walk with him. That's why our text ends the way it does. Look how verse 13 ends. That I may walk before God in the light of life. This shows you why you can walk with Christ because it's what you've been made to do. You are a new creature. Christ has taken the old and transformed it into somebody new. You're not the same old sinner. You've been redeemed. You walk anew because Christ has called you into covenantal union with him, that marrow bond and pledge. And he did this so you might live. And not just in eternity, but here and now. No matter what you face, no matter what you experience or encounter, God so loves you that he sends his son to die for you. So you think it's what you perish in this life for needless fears or foes? Of course not. Because he gives you his Holy Spirit so you have everything you need to keep walking with Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, you're equipped, enabled, and empowered to keep moving forward even when fear and death is all around. Because that's what Christ does for you. And this tells you, you can keep walking with Christ when it's scary, when it's hard. Even when you think you don't have the power to go on, Christ will pick you up and carry you. So you keep moving forward. You just need to say, in God I trust. And actually live it out by keep walking with Christ. Understand, hear this, get this thing. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. And that's why... You can always say, in God I trust, and show it as you keep walking with Christ. Sally's running down when she's exhausted, screaming, people hot on her tail. But all of a sudden, she's got a beacon of hope. She sees a payphone. Remember the archaic machines? You find them once in a while. She sees a payphone. So she reaches in her pocket, and she pulls out a quarter. And she's got to slap it and put it in the slot. And what she sees... Those words that are printed there, in God I trust, in God we trust. And it reminds her where she needs to place her hope and her trust. See, ever since 1957, every U.S. coin minted, every U.S. dollar bill printed must have these words, in God we trust. You know how they came about? Because it's 1956, the 84th Congress unanimously decided as they're battling with the Soviet Union, Russia, and the Cold War, and they're telling us about their military might, their strength, what they're going to do to us. We stamp these words on our currency to let everybody know we don't put our trust in our might, our military, or our money, but we place our trust in our God. In God we trust. And you know what's amazing about that? You can reach into your pocket today and pull out a dollar bill and don't you still see there 63 years later? In God we trust. It's still there. The words are there. But do we still say it? And do we still believe it? When everything looks bleak and hopeless, do you still say, in God I trust? Ask yourself this question. If this pandemic turned out to be far worse than anyone even imagined, not a couple million people dying, but half the world's population drops dead, Bodies piled up in the street. Bread lines for miles. No food. No sustenance. Starving all around. If you found your loved ones scattered and dead, 
standing alone in the cave like David, would you still say, in God I trust? Or would you give in to fear and start looking for somewhere else for your hope? So you know you can always trust in God because Jesus Christ calls you to himself first. And he does that so you can walk with him when the skies are sunny. Because if you walk with Christ when the skies are sunny, then you'll keep walking with him when the skies are blue. Because it doesn't depend on your power or your strength. It depends on God's promises. Sends his son to die. Raise him from the dead so you might live. And keep walking with him no matter what you face. So as you go down the streets and you see how they're barren and empty, as you think about messages of doom and gloom and despair, as you go and battle the church doors and find your clothes and they won't let you in, don't give up hope. Don't give in to fear and panic. But continue to say, in God I trust. Do this knowing that it shows you're trusting not in your strength, but in God's. Hear this, get this down. Trust God to keep you walking with Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you this morning. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that we know we can say, in God I trust, because you first call us in the covenantal union with you. We thank you and praise you for the person and work of Jesus Christ that secures our victory on the cross. So help us, Lord, even when we're afraid, never to give in to panic, but to turn to you and say, in God I trust. And Lord, help us to truly keep walking with Christ, knowing that you enable us to do so. We ask these things. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>